thank you so much for joining. Hey, nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, would you like to start with sharing some information about your background? Of course, yeah, my name is Pierre. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of uh, Cal.com. It's an open source scheduling product. We mostly sell to enterprise and uh, startups that need embedded software for scheduling, such as marketplaces for telehealth or hiring marketplaces. Um, we also have a consumer product, which is Cal.com slash Pierre, which would be like my scheduling link. Um, and that's entirely free for individuals. Um, so we kind of do like the open source approach where we just have code and, and the product for free, but then we, we end up charging the, the enterprise companies. Um, yeah. And it's been going on for like, what is it now? 2023. Holy sh yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I think we're approaching the, the second year. Uh, if I'm not incorrect, I need to double check when we actually started, but um, yeah, I'm excited to to be working in this and excited to be here. I'm excited for you. And I recently, I'm happy to say, transitioned from Calendly to Cal.com. Uh, and so the, <laughs> the growth has been phenomenal. Would you like to highlight some of the metrics? I think I think the most uh, impressive one from the open source is that we just reached 15,000 stars on GitHub, uh, I think two days ago or something, which I would not have imagined. I mean, there's only like a thousand projects or something I, I have to double check that but like it's it's not a lot of repositories that reach that milestone and to think that um yeah it, it was just an idea like one and a half years ago is is, is mind-blowing um and then on the on the on the uh usage i mean we have almost uh 50 000 accounts which are on cal.com over 120 000 docker in, like polls which is crazy i mean i don't even know where they where they all went that's the the downside of open source you, you never really know who's using your product <laughs> um but uh yeah and i think we're close to two million bookings um uh done over cal which is uh pretty mind-blowing that two million people met because we just built something in our living rooms <laughs> <laughs> and so how how did it get how did it start and what was your decision like to, to open source it. So the origin story is actually kind of interesting because I was running a different business before called Lean Hire. Um, that is, uh, or that used to be a, a contract to hire a marketplace for um, remote workers to join a company before signing the full like paperwork to become a full-time employee. It's basically, um, you start at a company as a contractor first for about a month, uh, four to six weeks, and you define a very well-scoped project um, where you can say, was this good? Was this bad? Um, and then you eventually, both the company, but also the contractor can decide if they want to continue working together. And um, that model, you know, contract to hire has been around for forever. But um, I think given the shift with COVID to, uh, to remote work, uh, we've seen a, a huge inbound of people hiring remotely. And it's quite uncertain, you know, you don't meet the person and, you in 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 your office, and so um that marketplace was growing really quickly, and uh we were using Calendly for the scheduling, right? It's the only thing that I was aware of that was decent at scheduling and and scheduling links and products like Calendly, Savicol are amazing products. But um for me as a marketplace provider, it was uh it was a black box. It was really hard to make changes and customize the UI and, you know, make it feel like it's my product and access the data. You know, if it's a SaaS product, it's really hard to get the data from a SaaS product. And so uh, I was basically Googling for Calendly open source. Like, like that was literally my keyword and uh, couldn't find any compelling product ever. Like it was none. There was a few uh, Reddit posts and, um, and I think um, on, on Hacker News, people asking for like, hey, does anyone know like an open source Calendly? I need this for X, Y, Z. I was like, huh, interesting. I need this too. Why don't I like just start it like, and just started like a GitHub repository with like a simple landing page and a wait list. Um, and uh, that was during Lean Hire. That was like, I think October, 2020. And and life came around and, and I, I got an offer to to sell Lean Hire and join uh, on deck as, as head of product. And um, that happened, I think, in December 2020 or January 2021. 
and I was like completely stopped working on this project. Like it had no traction, no nothing. No one really cared. I mean, some people signed up for the wait list, but it was like not enough. And then after two, three months of not working on it, somehow people found the project. I don't know if it was on GitHub or or if they found it on, on Hacker News or somewhere. But like, yeah, people were signing up for the wait list now. Suddenly, uh, I, I don't remember, maybe 10 per day and then later like 20, 30 per day. And I was like, what, what's going on here? Like, wh why do people care about this? And And I haven't worked on it for like six months, right? I was employed at this new company. And so I... I looked on Twitter and uh, in my community, like, hey, I have this waitlist product. Is anyone interested in like taking it over? Give me like uh, a minority percentage of equity, but like, I'm happy to give it up because I'm like full-time employed and I, I don't see myself working on this. And um, I found this, uh, this, this engineer whose name is Bailey and who's now my, my co-founder and 50-50 and, um, partner. And he was like, yeah, I'm totally down. Let's start hacking on it. And so he he built like the very first MVP. Uh, it was just like a Google Calendar interface. No, I mean, we have so many calendars nowadays, but like it was a very basic prototype. And that one really struck a nerve. Like it, it went like both viral on Product Hunt, Hacker News, Reddit. And it was just crazy. Like product of the day, of the week, of the month, I think where we were like fourth or fifth product of the year, like in total. And it has like over two, two and a half thousand uh, likes on product hunt. And uh, um, yeah, it was, it was just crazy. And the product was so trash. Like Bailey said that it, it was almost embarrassing how, how bad it was. We didn't have like a, a weekly overview. Like there was no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It was just like seven days in a row and like a grid. And also our calendars always started at the top left, you know, a, a true calendar layout. You know, it's like shifted based on the, the month. Um, it was really bad. Like it, it, it was, it was not, it was, it was, but, but people saw the vision behind an open source Calendly and they saw the need and the, and they, and they had the, their own use case for, for the product. Um, and those things we fixed within the first week, you know, like it's, once you see people care, you, you, you just ship those, those, uh, fixes. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of like the, the origin story. I, I then. I think when I approached Bailey, I asked like, hey, um, if this ever becomes like, you know, like a serious thing, even if it, it, he could have just kept it going, you know, like I wouldn't mind. But like I said, if if you ever plan on, you know, making something big, like can I rejoin as a 50-50 co-founder and, and like put in all my work and all my energy? And and so we agreed on like a, a prenup and uh, yeah. And then Product Hunt blew up and I was like, okay, <laughs> I think I have to, switch courses and and uh yeah left on deck um and uh on deck invested in in cal which is hopefully returning <laughs> quite decently and uh yeah I, I joined full time with bailey uh ever since and um yeah that's kind of like the, the origin story I, I love that story personally because it's like i do love it myself thank you for sharing it, it's it's such a it's a it, it's always like you you say the startup ideas, you, you can't just sit in a, in a think tank and be like, what's the next big, big thing? Like typically those things approach you. Like it's, it's almost like you got pulled. Like, yeah, it's it, it, it is exactly. And, and same for, I mean, people have different, uh, just, um, different definitions of product market fit, but it's basically like, it's pulling you into, into a direction. And, and that's really what you feel like. It's, it's, it's like a it's like a current in the water and you just you can't swim against it you just need to go with it like it's yeah it's pretty cool I love, I love it. and uh so now you got pulled in this direction of basically starting a new company and as a new open source project how did you navigate you know picking a license the simple stuff to thinking about monetization and the business model uh were those things completely clear from the get-go or a work in progress yeah it was for us, it was very clear that it had to stay open source or have to be an open source company from the get go. It's not something where you, you start with a, a cool app and then you decide to open source it later. For us, the, the open sourceness was the main uh, reason to start it because we wanted to self host it, embed it in our existing products, lean higher. Um, so that was always been clear. The license we've changed, we initially started with MIT, which is the most liberal license could take um but that was before we 
that was kind of like just the the side project nature of Calendar, which was the name before. When we saw so much commercial interest and traction, we had like uh, early, uh, like within the last, like within the first three weeks or something, like way too big companies reached out to like, hey, can we, you know, work on like work, use this and, and stuff. And we're like, actually, I mean, this is kind of early, like maybe like, like let's talk in a year or something. And and so we we read a lot about licensing and and issues down the road, and um, we wanted to be very upfront that this is a commercial open source software. There is a difference between FOSS and COS, free free open source software and commercial open source software. I personally believe that a lot of issues in the open source community come from lack of funding, and to get funding, you typically need to have a commercial product that makes revenue, right? Like if you just have, I remember Log4j, which was like this uh, Java uh, logging tool that had a vulnerability. Um, it was just not, there was no funding behind that thing. It was like two hobby engineers, three hobby engineers, and it was used by all these major yes. companies, right? Because the license was free and, and no one had to pay anything. And, um, and so you kind of need to have a balance between security, funding, and license and royalties. And so we went with the AGPL version three, which is a copy left license, um, which means you can use it open source, but you have to stay open source and you have to technically contribute back if you make improvements to the code base. Now that's something really hard to, to uh, enforce, but at least it is in the license, um, which is, again, it's an open source license, uh, like licensed by uh, or allowed by the Open Source Institute. But um, that at least helps us to keep the community that also provides, you know, like the, the contributions to stay public. Mm -hmm. And and if you take a look at Elastic, let's say, which had this huge, messy conflict with AWS, which... AWS basically just took the code and made it private and called it AWS Elastic. That would not really happen with AGPL um, unless they violate the law. Um, other downsides is that it is a bit more restrictive than M MIT, right? Like that's just the the the, the idea. Uh, and adding to that license, same as Git, that we have a, an enterprise edition which just has like single sign-on, like things that a hobby engineer doesn't really need. Um, we try to don't put too many locks on the product uh, to to keep keep it as accessible as possible. But you know things that bigger companies are willing to pay money for and have to. I mean, most companies have to pay at least support plans for the software that they need. Um, that's where we yeah we we built like an enterprise license where you need to pay us for 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 the usage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing all this. This is actually this can be super beneficial to people just starting out creating in the space. Yeah, and you took the route of also uh, securing financially the project as well and making sure there's resources. Would you like to at all touch uh, on this and maybe? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so we were very fortunate in 2021 to to quickly raise a Series C after Product Hunt, a uh, pretty big one. It was 7.4 million, I think, right, right out of the gates. Uh, it was uh, crazy how much inbound there was. Um, I know the startup landscape looks different now, but I do think that the, the, the initial traction we had with the Product Hunt and the just the inbound and one of the fastest growing GitHub repositories around that time. And so it was definitely a very hot deal uh and 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 we managed to to close that seed run with amazing investors um and uh but the, but the growth didn't really stop after product hunt right like we've did an amazing job turning that initial traction into a, a huge community and, and the github stars and the the commercial adoption so we did raise a series a i think in december or maybe january um so like within the same year um which was 25 million uh series a so like total funding is now 32.4 i think it's all public on calocom slash open which is kind of like our open open startup page um and that that funding alone gives us like probably 18 years of runway now it's not gonna <laughs> be 18 years because you know eventually we end up hiring more people like potentially this year or next year so like but um we kind of i mean 
I wouldn't say we knew that there was like a inflation slash recession slash like startup uh, uh, explosion coming up, but we kind of were like, okay, like how can we, how can we build a company that just doesn't focus on raising money every six months or every 12 months, uh, regardless of the market economics. I've did that before my previous startup before we constantly had like not enough funding and, and the startup advice is kind of interesting. Like some people say like, don't raise too much funding. Other people say like raise on good terms, like how much, like, raise more than you need for whatever bad times so it's kind of like there's not really a single do you think? answer do you think? Do you think i think honestly yeah i think i think we were very we were very lucky in that regard that it was a, a good market but we were very also um we had leverage and if you have leverage you have more um better deals coming in and and better deals also means like working with some of the best investors that have a 10 year time horizon that don't um that that do their that due diligence that they help and and you know make help make progress um but i do think you need to be realistic with your burn rate like our burn rate is crazy cheap like we're still burning uh like a pre seed seed company just because uh we 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 grow headcount by product not the other mm -hmm. way around like you can't hire more people and expect them to grow the business it, it, in fact I, i'd even say the business moves slower the more people you hire and and so even though we have we were quite lucky to raise the series a there was a not really a necessity in terms of like runway like we already had with the seven million in, in the seed round uh a decent amount of runway but it's like something okay if you if you do plan to build a huge business which we do plan and you have kind of like the initial signs of product market fit and you have a good team and a good product and people really, you really comes okay who do i want to work with how much money do i need to let's say go public or build like a a, a huge business and and truth is you probably need 100 million to go public it's just nowadays what the industry looks like maybe you can get away with a very profitable business and you only raise like 50 to 70 million but uh, if you take a look at most recent IPOs, it's probably more cash intensive than you think. And so now the idea changes from, okay, how do I extend my runway to how, what type of firm, what type of partners, what type of funding do I need to execute my 10 year vision? Right. And 10 years is a long time, you know, like it's, a, and, and, and um, the only way I always say is like companies die because of lack of, motivation and lack of funding and so if you get the funding out of the way you can only focus on your motivation and if as long as you wake up every day and it's like fucking epic then you're pretty much good to go to succeed there's really nothing stopping you so to get that out of the way i think if you have the chance it makes a ton of sense i i don't recommend having a a burn plan like i know some people be like Oh, we have a budget of two million, but we only spent one. So let's hire two more people, three more people. It was like you should hire people because your business needs it, not because you have the budget or the funding. So, um, yeah. Thank you for dissecting all this. Uh, very important and uh, not popular opinion. You don't hear this often times, which is crazy because it makes sense. And for the early stage folks, when you are experiencing that pool, which also translates into leverage, it also gives more clarity into the direction and where to allocate new resources. And so, you know, got to wait for that moment, I think, to make yeah. steps there. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm a fan of your approach here. And so now related topics, you know, because you covered funding, uh, hiring and growing the team from the beginning to support the growing contributor base uh, to now. How are you approaching hiring? So we do, we still do contract to hire. <laughs> so that hasn't changed. Um, and so we, we're very um, fortunate to have a, a huge open source community that I think 200 contributors or something that maybe have done one PR. Some of them have done 20 PRs. Um, and so that talent pool alone is amazing to tap into. And we, I think we've extended three or four offers of early contributors. So if you do plan on working on Cal at Common full time, make sure to <laughs> check out our repository. Um, that's just a cheat code. You know, that's something no private company can compete against. 
um, because you've already worked with that person over like two, three months and you, you see how they how they work, what, what type of code they, they, uh, they merge. And so that's something we've always focused on to involve the community. We, even for normal contributions, we hand out gifts and, and sometimes payments if it's like uh, crucial security PRs or, or anything that's high, of high value. Most of the PRs are just like changing the color of a button, but hey, I mean, <laughs> go for it. And so, so that's, that's a huge hiring funnel for us um, and a very successful one. Um, that being said, we are very particular who and when we hire, um, going back to the burn question. Um, I think the team is 20 people now. We just hired our second intern today from Sri Lanka, who also has been contributing for the last two months on the code base. And um, yeah, the team is fully global. I think we maybe have like people in 70, 80% of time zones right now. Like uh, really, the yeah, from, from Uruguay to to uh sri lanka basically or maybe even beyond um we don't have people in new zealand or australia huh that that could be interesting um but yeah um briefly also an engineer from china um that was a, a bit hard because of the covid lockdowns he lost internet access which is pretty terrifying <laughs> but um no i mean um yeah the team is 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 very spread out and and um I think one thing we can say about hiring is we, we pay global salaries, which is um, also kind of like rare and it is becoming more. There's a couple of companies that do that, but I'm a huge advocate for that because in my opinion, um, it is, it's really hard to come up with a local salary um, and it's, it's also unfair for people who move, for people who... You could live in San Francisco, let's say. It's a very high salary market, but you could live with your parents, right? And not pay rent. And now you make four or five times more as a junior than the senior engineer from 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 uh, from a, a lower cost country, right? Yeah. And so that's just, I, there's, with this debate, local versus global salaries, there's always drawbacks, right? But for me, it's like, okay, the most fair is is money for code. If you treat, you know, work as something like where you present value to a company and you want to be fairly compensated, I don't think the manager should care what your living situation is. It is it is actually kind of privacy infringing because it's like, all right, do you pay more if you have four kids, five kids? Like my you could live in a in a cheap country, but in a in a like cost efficient country, but still have a high burn. Like, how do you justify all of this, right? So, it it, it kind of opens up a, a can of worms, in my opinion, to have like these local salaries and and a lot of unfairness. And also, honestly, I think also a lot of subtle racism, because if you look at let's say wealthy northern European or American countries, you may and you likely end up paying more to someone in whatever in germany or denmark or, or sweden then you pay you know the intern that we just hired in sri lanka and technically to elevate you know let's say uh, to to get rid of racism and and, to, and level the playing field you just don't have these conversations like right like you, you pay the same for an internship in germany than in sri lanka and obviously that's a huge deal for engineers in sri lanka or you know uruguay or or uh, Costa Rica or um, Romania, Poland. And and what happens is now the best people of these regions want to work for your company because obviously that's a high a higher uh, multiple than what they would get in, in a local company. And so now instead of competing with Facebook and Google in, in Silicon Valley, and frankly speaking, even if you pay that salary, chances are that they won't stay longer than a year in your company because of other perks and and other reasons. You end up hiring pretty much the best from these these markets, and and I think um, if I look back, how we want to distribute funding and 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 payroll, uh, knowing that the money goes a long way 
it's it's just amazing. I mean, with a uh, with a I'd say like a European salary in 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 Sri Lanka, you can pay for the whole family and and basically buy laptops for your brother and teach them how to code and you know like that. That's just awesome, in my opinion. And and these engineers are literally the same quality and output. Like it's not like there's any difference. Like you, if you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know. And and so that's just yeah, that's something I'm I'm, I'm still very proud of having uh, global salaries. Now there are uh exceptions that you need to make like let's say you hire a salesperson in san, in san francisco and you sure you need to be you need to be there i think then you have to have a local bonus like just a local yeah bonus um but if you have a remote job and you can work from anywhere and and uh, and you, you should work from anywhere then i think it's it's the most fair in my opinion um Absolutely. and also what we've seen is We've seen people literally in our team move to live in Switzerland from India for a couple of weeks or months. And this would not happen. Like this would just not happen, right? Like, and, yeah. Yeah, it's life changing. And I, I'm a digital nomad. So like, should I change my salary every time I move? Like if I go from Germany to whatever, uh, yeah. Uh, to Again, for a month common, in sense, common sense things and yeah. very helpful yeah. and refreshing to say these. Yeah. And we don't hear it often. Uh, and, and all these things are public, right? Like what people get paid and where they yeah. come from. It's all in your public metrics. So w- would you like to just talk briefly about the decision to be yeah. an open startup and what that has been like? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's also from day one. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of issues um, stem from lack of transparency in the company. Um, if you don't, Let's say you you don't know what you're working for. Like, you, let's say the team has done a bad job of communicating the core KPI, which could be, let's say, revenue or monthly active users or um, daily installs, whatever your metric is. So, so that's the first thing. If the team doesn't know what they're working for, it's a bad for motivation and it's b lack bad for like lack of direction and and they may work on things that are not relevant for the core team. So that's something for like. For, for just the day-to-day data. Now that's something you can keep private just within the team. But to be honest, we have an open community, which means we have contributors, we have fans like that are rooting for us to succeed that want us to, you know, may, uh, like that are like happy when we reach a milestone and stuff. So having a community, now you also want to have them invested and see where the funding, let's say the funding goes into. You don't want to see a company raise 32 million and then here the next day okay founder went off to the bahamas and slacking around like transparency in this in this types of companies is, is key and so um yeah very early on we thought about okay what's what are kpis what are metrics that we can publish and i've always been a huge fan of, of also uh, open salaries because again it promotes transparency reduces racism and uh yeah that's what we came up with. I love it. Um, I think everyone can can consider uh, this is uh, this is super interesting. Any big surprises building an open source that you've had? Um, big surprises. Uh, I I'm not sure. I think um, I think the biggest surprise is how people actually end up using the product. That's something you don't really expect. You know, like when you. You have this idea how people end up using a product, but then they take it and build the weirdest things with it. Uh, we have like a company that does uh, um, home, what's, what's it called? Like a realtor who goes to homes and like shows, mm-hmm. yeah, like inspection, not inspections, but like home home visiting. No, what's it called? I don't remember. And and so they use Cal for scheduling like a, a visit to see a new a new house or something. Um, then there's companies who obviously use it for telehealth or vaccine and stuff. Um, I think the biggest surprise for me also kind of like emotional was that uh, it was a, I think there's a, a refugee camp in, in Moria, which is actually, is it in Greece? No. Uh, Moria. I th- Moria. I, I think it is in Greece. No, no. Or Italy, I don't remember. But there's a refugee camp which uses Cal to schedule like services and um, 
yeah, all kinds of services uh, for for uh, for local uh, local refugees. And so that's something I'm like, oh shit! Like you're really that's the beauty of open source. You know, you never know who you really who you're really reaching, um, right. and how how you can help people. And that's that's been awesome. That's been an awesome surprise, and I'm very very excited about those things to to read and hear. <laughs> this is I love this. And so now biggest challenge if again we have been hearing about all these positive aspects of being open source and an open startup yeah. and so biggest challenge yeah so the biggest challenge is and i i think for anyone who wants to go open source is you really need to know what you're getting into because there's really no way of going back like it's really hard to turn an open source project into a, a proprietary like you basically need to shut down the open source repo which really sucks um so knowing getting knowing what you're getting into now the the downsides that no one's talking about is open source is really, really hard when it comes to complexity, product, community, um, different stakeholders. You know, you have the free freemium users, you have the enterprise customers. Basically, our spectrum of users is the hobby engineer and uh, Fortune 500 companies. And they have very, very different needs and very different expectations, right? Um, so that's really hard in terms of product making decisions what types of features to prioritize and 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 deprioritize and and having literally everyone be able to write an issue and create a comp like can be overwhelming i think there's like 600 open issues that we have right now pretty much half of them are either obsolete or or like don't don't fix kind of things and so that's something where you need to just be confident knowing that okay even though there is a, a huge community like posting issues that you're like doing still the right things. Um, and also I think one thing I'm, I've been kind of like sad about is that there are people who expect everything, but give nothing back. Mm. Um, there is a, there's a certain type of person who goes into a community Slack says, Hey, I have this issue. It doesn't work. You're all bad people. Like, please help. And and then you don't reply within ten minutes, and they're like, "Hello, anyone there?" And then they leave, and and just and you're just like, you didn't pay for the product. No one owes you an answer. Like, be be nice to people. You know, like these common traits, and and that sometimes is heartbreaking because like, yeah, there's like twenty people working day and night to make this product the best that they can think of, and there's hundreds of or potentially thousands of developers who who also help on on their free time, and then you're just coming around expecting a free product to immediately work, uh, and 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 then when you don't get a, a response within like ten minutes, you're 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 salty and you just leave a bad vibe. That doesn't happen often, but it definitely does happen, and it's just. It could be so about it, How you feel? Yeah. You know, a lot, yeah. a lot of people experience this. Um, yeah. Are there people that uh, that you've been following that helped you in your early decisions as an open source founder? Some of you look up to or take their advice. So we are very close to a couple open source companies, but also um, companies that are very uh, promoting open source. Uh, Vercel is one of those companies that uh, I've been working with closely. Um, Guillermo invested in in our seed round, and um, Vercel has been a fantastic hosting partner for us. From the very early days so that's yeah shout out to them even stephen tay who's also an investor who's a, a developer advocate and see no def rel at, at uh, Vercel. but um no there's plenty of uh i mean tailwind is amazing um to to be using next.js obviously by Vercel is, is amazing um i think there's also shout out to um JJ from Open Source Capital, who's our seed investor, he is probably the most open source advocate you can find. Like, hands down, probably the best investor in the space uh, by 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 far. I think has like more than ten percent of the most popular repositories invested in or something. And he's 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 an amazing sparing partner when it comes to licensing or business model or growth and freemium versus premium decisions and. Um, yeah, really, really fortunate. And and lastly, I think Alexis Wahanian with his Reddit and product experience is probably hands down one of the best solo GPs out there. 
good looks giving uh, shout outs to these folks. What would be your advice to people getting started? Uh, maybe a mistake or a pitfall to avoid? And it didn't sound like there has been, <clears throat> but yeah, what would be your advice? I, uh, I don't think, I don't think there is something like overnight successes. I mean, you hear this all the time. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very long grind, not even with a product that has interest, like in general, as a founder, like this is my 11th year now as a founder, as a, like an entrepreneur and, and, and product person. And I've probably launched like 30 products in the last 10 years, minimum has to be probably more. And the first startup failed. Second one was acquired. Third one is now Cal or fourth actually. Um, it just, yeah, it's, it's a numbers game and you never really know what the market wants and something could work in 2020 and doesn't work in 2021, right? Like it's, right. it's just timing, luck being at the right, being at the right time in the right place. And, um, I think to increase your chances, you know, to be lucky, you need to just keep on do, doing things. Like, I think a lot of people underestimate the power of pivots like i've seen companies i've actually invested in a couple companies that did like a hard pivot and within two weeks they had more users than they've had in the previous product for like a year or two years right like sometimes you just struck a yeah find the lightning in the bottle and then yeah you just focus on that instead like i think while you have the time don't be afraid to try out new things um and then the decision needs to be okay. If if you really see traction in a product, the next question to yourself has to be: Do I want to work on this for the next ten years? Like, if you have a single doubt about like, okay, like I have this project and it's getting a thousand signups per day, but I don't really like, uh, I don't really like chatbots, right? Like I built this on the weekend, but like I don't really see myself like it's it's cool, but it's like just don't work on it, like. Get, find someone to take over or make it or sell it or make it as low maintenance as possible. So you don't need to, you know, invest much time in it. it may turn into a cash cow. But like, I think the biggest risk is that people then feel like they, they have to go that way. Um, it's worse to have a good product, but then kind of like waste 10 years and be sad about the time and like be angry at your job. Then, to keep on experiment, experimenting until you have something that grows and you like working on. I think that's the minimum requirement. And because it's really hard to build something for, you know, five to 10 years when you don't like the project. I, um, I take and, all this advice yeah. to heart as a founder yeah. for sharing yeah. it and, and, and highlighting how long you've been in this space, right? How long you've been building. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we shall, we shall need to jump back into the, the link. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. All right. So, you know, when I reached out to you, you mentioned that you've been looking for a, for a bounties platform for a while. So what are the plans at cal.com for rewarding contributors? How have you been thinking about this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as any open source community, it's important to keep a, the community engaged, but also involved. And I think the majority of open source contributors do it for the sheer love of open source and giving back to the community and i'm uh i'm, I'm a huge fan of doing the same you know and other projects I'm, I'm not looking for a quick buck just to to help but there are scenarios i mean first and foremost like security fixes are always paid that's just something it's not fair if someone finds like a vulnerability and then you don't pay them you know that's just yeah that's I'd, I'd say that the baseline of compensation for open source projects, um, no, but there's always going to be uh, tickets or or uh, things that you would like to prioritize, and I think the way to inv to um, have kind of like your own like Upwork or your own whatever uh, Fiverr is to just have your own kind of like credits or gift system. And I think that's very interesting to to label issues as like bounty or whatever, and and then um, show the community maybe have a dashboard of open tasks that people can pick up, just to prioritize them. Um, there's always a risk that you end up just paying people for contributions, and that's like not really the spirit of open source. But 
uh, having it as an option, I think is always a great idea. I think so too. And so you envision it as a, a portal for your own community that sits under your domain or uh, your thoughts go that far? Uh, no, I mean, we don't really care about where it lives or as if it's an integration or something or, or a branded service, but like, uh, it's definitely better for us as a product team to be in charge of what has a bounty and what doesn't have a bounty and how much um, those things should stay in the core team because they're the best ones to, to judge, in my opinion. Absolutely. And for the whole workflow to be yeah. seen. And so do you guys have a timeline at the company in terms of you know experimenting with this kind of uh, reward? Uh, I, I was looking into it last year already. Uh, I didn't really find a good service. Um, so I think it's, it's not a major decision. We're probably going to start looking into it like very soon. Um, there's another company called gitstart.com, which uh, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's kind of like the other way around. They have a pool of engineers and you just label tickets for them, assign them for them, and then they just start working on them. It's very different to like just a bounty system where you just post the bounty and people work on it. Like you don't know who's working on it. But yeah, no, we definitely this year want to work on on really leveraging the open sourceness of our repository and, and have as many eyeballs and as many engineers get get cracking and, and hacking and potentially I could see the bounty system for like apps in our app store, you know, like build an app for like build a Zoom integration, which I mean that one exists already, but like build an integration into a new video service or a new calendar that just launched, you know, those types of things I think could be really nice for, for bounties. Definitely. And for this kind of initiative that is, you know, new for you, it's kind of be new for most projects out there. Like how do you even approach kind of like putting a budget on it and you know, how you ramp it up? Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that, that's, I say the hardest thing, but also easier when you have a global salary, because now we can benchmark what we would pay for an engineer in our team. Like if someone gets paid, let's say 4k a month, and you would estimate this thing to be one week of work, then it's 1K, right? Pretty simple math. But um, I think if anything we know about software engineering is that estimates always suck. <laughs> like, uh, it's You never know until you know how long something takes. And um, yeah, it's always a, a guessing game. And at the end of the day, it's, it's supply and demand. If your budget is too low, then you probably won't find someone and... Um, yeah, that's kind of like how you should probably budget accordingly. Sounds good. Well, thanks for sharing these these thoughts on this topic, and, uh, <laughs> and we are excited to to try to make a yeah. Here. I'm excited to try. I'm excited to try the product. Honestly, I, I think when I saw it, I was like, okay, I need something that's like deeply integrated into GitHub, um, and and this seems like the right the right approach. I think so too. And and you know, very quick backstory, but uh, we were focused on closed source uh, before. Ooh. And, you know, last summer we launched on Hacker News, where on the homepage, hundreds of engineers registered yeah. saying, hey, we want to use bounties, we want to do this. Uh, but we had a hard time onboarding companies, actually. Mm. And uh, just a month and a half ago, we made the decision, let's transition to helping open source community. They're better fit for this today. Yeah. And immediately we saw a difference yeah. in the pool, kind of like what you were Crazy. describing yeah. earlier. Yeah. 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 Like first week, a project from Switzerland with 15,000 stars mm. registered, completed bounties. We started speaking mm. to your companies and, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's very neat and very timely. Uh, so we, this is the best time in the lifetime. Yeah. Far. I agree. I agree. I, I mean, the beauty of, of open source and, and commercial open source is that it's kind of like a tight knit community. And so like it, it spreads like a wildfire. If there is a product that like launches within open source and, um, what I've seen is that a lot of uh, open source founders also use other open source software. And right. so that alone drives adoption within this this market, which is pretty cool. I mean, we use a ton of open source software in our company and uh, that helps a lot. And something actually for us to also uh, figure out yeah. in, in the pipeline. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> any, any, any last thoughts that you would like to uh, leave people? Um, my DMs are open if you have any questions uh, on Twitter. Uh, it's peer underscore uh, rich, R-I-C-H. I'm happy to also reply to emails, peer at cal.com or, or hook me <laughs> if you have something more serious. Um, 
but yeah, no, I'm, uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to jump on these calls and um, see, see how open source continues to grow. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye.